My name is Ingrid Bachman. I'm the Graduate Program Director in the MFA Studio Arts Department, and it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you here uh, to tonight's lecture in the Conversations in Contemporary Arts series. Tonight is a very special night because we are partnering for the first time, hopefully not the last time, with both the Canadian Art Foundation and the Biennale de Montréal um, 2014. I'd now like to invite Sylvie Fortin, the director of the Biennale, to say a few words. Thanks, Ingrid, and thanks everyone for showing up. It's been uh, a very a series of long days and lots of conversations, so thanks for hanging in there and joining us tonight. Yes, this is a very important, very special partnership with both Concordia University and the Canadian Art Foundation. We are partnering with Concordia on a number of events, and on November 24th here, uh, you'll have the chance of hearing before Berardi. We're also partnering with the Canadian Art Foundation on two other projects. Um, we are presenting uh, Thomas Hirschhorn on the 21st of November and uh, Sharon Nishat on the 28th. So lots to do and see, and, and we couldn't do it without those partnerships. I'd also like to thank uh, Creative New Zealand, um, an organization that supported, uh, in the first place, the, supported our ability to bring Simon to Montreal, so that needs to be acknowledged. Thank you. And um, I'd like to invite Samara Astor from the Canadian Art Foundation to introduce Simon. Thanks. Well, thank you, Sylvie, and thank you, Ingrid, um, and thank you all so much for being here this evening. It's a pleasure for us to be partnering with the Biennial, um, and congratulations to the entire team and artists and curators for such an incredible opening week. It's only Thursday, and I think everyone's probably exhausted already. <laughs> and thank you to Ingrid and Concordia as well for having us tonight. So we're so pleased to be here for the first of three talks that the Canadian Art Foundation is co-presenting with the Biennial. As Sylvie mentioned, um, tonight is our first with Simon Denny, uh, and later in November with Thomas Hirschhorn and Shirin Nishat. So we hope you will join us again for those presentations. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Canadian Art Foundation, we are, uh, we are Canada's national charitable foundation dedicated to bringing artists and art enthusiasts together to create visibility and appreciation for the visual arts in Canada. In addition to creating programming and mentorship initiatives, the foundation is also the publisher of Canadian Art Magazine, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. And uh, we have some free copies for you all um, at the tables just outside. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge BMO Financial Group and AMIA, who have so generously supported the Canadian Art Foundation and our international speaker series which allows us to collaborate with amazing partners such as the Biennial and Concordia tonight. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank Simon for his generosity in being here with us this evening and for bringing his work to Montreal and sharing his ideas with us tonight. So um, I won't keep you any longer and I'd like to present Simon Denny. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, I mean, I reiterate all those thank yous that were just said in succession. So <laughs> thank you to everybody who was mentioned beforehand. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just run through a number of recent projects um, with some slide images. And I'm going to start with the project that you've seen a version of in the Montreal Biennale here. And uh, this is a kind of a project that I started in Munich. Um, in 2013, but the kind of genesis for it is this um, is this this kind of image or this event, which was another kind of event where a lot of talks happened, a little similar to this, uh, which was like a tech conference. So, DLD or Digital Life Design is a um, is a conference run by Burda Media, which is like a kind of a print publisher actually. They publish a lot of um, important uh, magazines in Germany, like Focus Magazine. They do other, other types of publications as well, but it's one of the major publishers of media in um, Germany. But they also own this, uh, this tech conference where they invite people from basically the kind of Silicon Valley world. Um, uh, so at this particular iteration of it in 2012, there was Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook, 
uh, Jack Dorsey from Twitter and Square, um, uh, and a number of other kind of uh, Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia. These type of people come to speak, but it's also programmed with a kind of scientific and arts context as well. Here up the front in the image here, you have an, um, a lot of people applauding. I think it was a DJ spooky performance. And um, in the middle there is Hubert Boda. This is the guy who owns the company. So um, yeah, that's just, th this was an invitation card we used to my exhibition based on it. Here's another crowd shot. It was called All You Need Is Data. Uh, with a question mark on the end. Um, that was the theme for this year, uh, for that year's conference. Um, and there's kind of two venues, there's kind of two simultaneous stages where they have uh, kind of three days of very intensive programming based on theme, theme talks uh, with these companies and cultural people. Um, so this is an example of one of the stages. Uh, this is actually a, a talk about uh, digital policy, uh, digital actors in the policy space. So the guy speaking with the microphone um, is, is the, uh, was at that point the uh, advisor to Hillary Clinton in social kind of um, tech media. Um, and they were kind of uh, speculating on um, how they could crowdsource policy and stuff like this. And that's one type of thing that happens. Uh, and this is uh, the founder of Dropbox, speaking about Dropbox. So this is the kind of spread of people you get. But you can also get a sense here that there's quite an intense visual stage uh, component to it. And this is one of the things that attracted me to the conference. Um, here's a participant in the audience. Um, this is Cheryl Sandberg speaking. Uh, she gave a keynote presentation at the end. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Lean In, but it was pre-Lean In. Um, this is uh, Moot, uh, the guy who invented 4chan, founder of 4chan. So there was a real spread of uh, luminaries from that context. Uh, this is another image I used for the poster so, um, of my exhibition about this conference. Uh, and here you get a sort of overview of it. So there's Moot speaking about privacy. Um, and uh, he's speaking with a number of other people who uh, have in, in input on this kind of context. But you can see it's kind of a, this stage is a sort of, um, futuristic version of an alp alpine landscape. So, um, so Munich is in an alpine kind of context and the designer did this amazing job putting this sort of TV studio together to represent that. The other context, this is some Andrew Mason, the, uh, one of the founders of Groupon, uh, at that point one of the fastest growing um, uh, yeah, um, companies in the world. It was 500% year on year growth at that point. Um, digital savvy, just a number of little moments there. You can see a bit of the stage design. There's the second stage design. So this is more like a mountain shack. Um, so here you have like a number of people. This is the Dyson family. Um, they are like prominent physicists uh, family. And uh, yeah, that's more that you can see scientific and cultural people coming in from a kind of uh, tech perspective. We're also very point, point, you know, part of that program. So you can see deer heads, there's beer on the table. So it's kind of like you got these kind of two different settings between kind of a futuristic uh, alpine setting and a kind of retro alpine setting. This is a, um, this is a slide from um, Brian Chesky, who's one of the founders of Airbnb. And this is kind of a starting point for me uh, in the presentation. So access is more powerful than ownership. This is one of the key concepts of the, what they call the sharing economy, of which Airbnb is probably the most visible uh, proponent of it. Um, and this is, this is kind of, this is, this is the first cue aesthetically to how I was going to process this material into something that was um, kind of a documentary exhibition about this conference. So this is another concept that I thought was really important to that and school morphism. So um, some of you will know about this, but school morphism basically is uh, interface design, computer interface design that uses a kind of object, an image of an object to stand in for a function. So the easiest example of that is like um, Apple's, uh, if you know to put a file in the, in the trash because it looks like a trash can. Uh, this kind of logic um, was instrumental in kind of uh, in bringing people into knowing how to use uh, interfaces and, and feeling more familiar with them. It was really important to Apple's career. And at this point, it was uh, it's a situation where iOS 6, for those who use Apple uh, mobile platform, that was the kind of uh, dominant platform at that point. And iOS 6 heavily used uh, schoolmorphic uh, design. So you had like leather stitching on the corners of uh, books and you had kind of crumpled paper textures. It was really like, in my view, like a sort of end point to that. So I wanted to filter this, um, this whole conference into that uh, current design. So I, I took this kind of stage setting and made it uh, into this kind of design. So this is a panel. This is Andrew Mason's panel, um, uh, the co-founder of Groupon. And um, you have kind of uh, 
images of, uh, so every photograph was kind of an object photograph, so it was like a sort of Polaroid that's kind of stuck on to a space. And um, yeah, here you have a kind of lanyard telling you about what, which particular part of the um, exhibition it was, uh, at the conference it was mentioning. So this is his talk between 11.40 and 12 o'clock on Monday the 23rd of January, 2012. And uh, then I put a number of quotes, I kind of uh, garnered a number of quotes from all this material I took from HD footage, which DLD gave me access to using and reinterpreting. Um, and so all of the stills I isolated from that HD footage um, and also all the quotes I transcribed. So um, yeah, here we say, here we have him saying, uh, none of the people that we sold stock to are complaining about insider selling. Uh, plane crashes are more interesting to cover than safe landings. Um, this is uh, this is uh, this is another panel, and this is for the other stage setting that you saw before. Um, and this is Jimmy Wales, the founder of uh, Wikipedia. So um, yeah, you can see again this kind of school morph. You have this kind of dock down the bottom with a couple slide images, and uh, yeah, so there you can see uh, how that sort of looks. Um, the global brain and the greed access. This is a con concept of uh, the founder of um, the Russian version of Facebook, uh, V Contactor, and uh, at that at that uh, talk he gave the Wikipedia um, one million dollars on the spot. So it was an amazing moment in the talk. This is the Dysons. Uh, yeah, this is uh, so. There's a number of quotes in there, which I found interesting. This is some um, Nolan Bushell, the, the one of the key Atari people who invented Pong. Uh, Nolan Bushell is single-handedly the one who uh, contributed the most to the destruction of pro productivity in the world. I thought that was quite a nice idea. Uh, I never look back in the rearview mirror. It's the next thing I'm always focused on. This was something that I found important. So, like this community, I found very forward-looking. Um, I found them to be focused on ideas of how the world could be and, uh, and how their platforms were influencing that. Um, and this is why I also wanted to put this whole thing into a timeline. So uh, you've, if you've been to the Biennale, you may have seen this, but um, I made it into a kind of a extension-like timeline. So you have to kind of walk through all the three days. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a maze um, where you are kind of bombarded with a number of uh, different panels. Um, there's a durational aspect of it. So this is this is first a, a little bit more sparsely organized than what's at the Biennale. This is in the um, this is in the first presentation of the show, which was at the uh, a year after the um, event that it's covering. So it was at the next iteration. It's an annual event um, of DLD. Uh, so DLD even had a party in my exhibition there. So there was a kind of a nice situation where I was sort of giving them. Uh, a, a very short history of their own presentations, which was part of my strategy. Um, obviously, timeline is a organizational concept use uh, or strategy, which is really important to uh, concepts like you know platforms like Facebook and Twitter. These kind of chronological presentations become very important in that, and I wanted to make that a sort of monument to that style as an exhibition. Yeah, so a few more views from that installation. From the back, obviously, it becomes a kind of blank, so you can only kind of look forward, not, not backwards. Um, yeah, downstairs, an entranceway. Here's another installation of it, which is a little closer to the one you've seen. This is at Petzl in New York. Um, yeah, another, it kind of traveled around a little bit, and it was a little different every time I installed it, so I wanted to have this kind of drag and drop feel. So obviously then you kind of start, because the room was smaller, you start to have to kind of place parts on, uh, parts of the timeline outside of the timeline, like above or, and you see that extensively in the other spaces. This is in Auckland and New Zealand. Um, yeah, again, a little closer to what we have uh, here in Montreal. So that's a short introduction to that project. I'm going to kind of run quickly through a number of other projects, and then maybe we can speak to your interests at the end of it, if, if you have any. Um, this is another project I did about the same community, but in a, in a more kind of localized way. So Berlin is a place I live. I'm, I'm from New Zealand originally, but I moved to Berlin about five years ago. Um, and uh, Berlin has become one of these places where uh, the tech community is focused. So uh, it's a sort of tech hub. People start companies there. Um, uh, they call it ecosystem. So there's a Berlin ecosystem of companies starting. This poster is for an exhibition I made, a, another kind of documentary exhibition about the startup context in Berlin. And uh, yeah, this is a poster that I took from a hackathon that I went along to, uh, where the Evernote, uh, Evernote app was opening up its API to people redesigning things. And 
I quite like this because it's like a sort of stand-in for uh, what might be these companies starting point. Um, this is a this is a image of how um, the startup community is actually physically changing Berlin. So this is a this is a building uh, called the factory which is an old, um, it's built on the site of an old brewery, actually, uh, right in between east and west, so right on the wall, uh, up in Bernauerstrasse. Um, and uh, on there you see the Firefox uh, uh, advertisement, so that it's, it's going to turn into the, um, the home of SoundCloud. The, the SoundCloud is probably the most famous Berlin startup company. Um, so they, they have their, their headquarters there. Also Firefox will have it there. Also Google will have some things going on there. But they also foster young companies. They have kind of young companies coming in and working there. But they're literally changing the skyline of Berlin. Um, this is another conference that happens in Berlin, uh, sponsored by another media baron, um, Hi Berlin. Uh, Berlin works here. Uh, this is another type of conference. Conferences are a big part of this, uh, this scene. And Tech Open Air happens in an old rave context. Carter uh, uh, Holzig, for those who've been clubbing in Berlin. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so they try to kind of fit the tech scene to the Berlin landscape, let's say. This is Tech Country Disrupt. So this is probably the most known brand in the tech world for conferences. Um, TechCrunch is a blog that grew out of Silicon Valley, and uh, they run these events, which are kind of competitions, but also conferences like this. Um, and they did their first one in Berlin last year, uh, Tech Crunch Disrupt Berlin. And um, this is a scene from the panel there. So these are the type of activity that happened in this space. And I wanted to make a sort of portrait of uh, Berlin somehow, this community, and um, I was then getting interested in how I could package that, and one of those interests led me to um, the practice of case modding. So I don't know, some of you may be gamers in the context here, but um, if you are playing games very seriously, um, competitive gaming, you often want to kind of bring the best hardware to increase your performance. and. Um, these, uh, this kind of box, you kind of decorate if you're really into it, and uh, there's some really amazing examples of case modding. So I wanted to make a kind of case mod um, uh, homage to 10 top companies in Berlin at that moment. So um, this is an installation. That's a, that's a banner from TechCrunch Disrupt you see on the wall there. Um, so TechCrunch Disrupt Berlin sort of put its branding over Berlin's Brandenburger Tour, which is uh, reminiscent of other things that have happened in Berlin in the past. Um, and uh, then there's also a couple of these case mods uh, sitting there. Um, this is a case mod to a company called IM, uh, which is sort of a, in, in a, it's a photo sharing app, a little bit in a similar space to, um, yeah, it's been described as the Instagram of Germany. Uh, it, this is a kind of fully, um, what would you call it, uh, mirror glass box. Uh, so I wanted to have these case mods be sort of like branding exercises, kind of like miniature buildings, kind of like, uh, kind of like trophies to each of these companies, like something in the middle of these things. And it's sitting atop a platform which is playing a, a kind of trailer for one of those events that I showed you in the beginning. So this is the box that I made it from. You can buy these things off the shelf. This is like a big market. A lot of these things are actually made in Taiwan, interestingly enough. It's a big gaming community in Taiwan. Um, this is another one from Sociomantic, uh, a company that kind of uh, is a bit of a behind the scenes marketing company for apps. Um, ROI sits up top of it, return on investment. This is a very important thing that Sociomantic is interested in increasing for these companies. Uh, here we have the installation shot. So I kind of um, hung uh, kind of info boards on um, on these kind of fences, which you put around construction sites in Berlin. Again, it was about sort of a changing landscape and how this community was affecting uh, the yeah the the whole the whole way Berlin works. So the innovator's dilemma is. Um, is, uh, is one of the most important books in this space. I don't know if you guys have come across the term disruptive, but this is a very key concept for this community. So uh, the, to use again the Apple metaphor, the iPhone disrupted the whole market space of, um, of, of mobile phones, right? So this is like what a lot of these companies are aiming for, is to disrupt a market. And uh, The Innovator's Dilemma is the book which coined that term. Um, yeah, and I, I called this show Disruptive Berlin. Um, yeah, you know, TechCrunch Disrupt, it comes in there. Clue, this is an app, this is the only female founded app in the top 10 for this year. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a troubled gender space uh, in a way, this context. Uh, there's not as many female founders as there are male founders in Berlin. Um, but this is an app which tracks your cycle, uh, which tracks, tracks uh, men menstrual cycle, so you know how, what's going on. 
Um, this again, you saw the scale change here. This is um, the billboard from the factory. I got, uh, I borrowed that from Mozilla. Doing good as part of our code. Again, kind of oversees these little miniature buildings. Um, Wooga, this is a social gaming company, very important social gaming company in the Berlin context. Uh, this is another kind of diagram uh, that I was using. So I would overlay these double mesh pieces, which would interact uh, different visualizations of what was happening. This is a really nice drawing um, done uh, about uh, the uh, the attraction, the addictiveness of being involved in this type of culture. So you have uh, you have your freewheeling culture. You have conferences, which are a big part of it. Meaningful work, the idea of entrepreneurship, self-image. It's the ash on the end. Um, here's the process, uh, the ideal process. You get the, uh, yeah, the tech crunch of innovation, the wearing off of novelty, and this is kind of tracing the, somehow tracing the bottom of the US, which I thought was pretty interesting as well. Um, yeah, this is the kind of, this is the kind of, uh, yeah, the, the setup for those pieces. Here, yeah, the triumphant uh, piece, uh, SoundCloud. It's the biggest and most impacting company in, in, uh, in Berlin, and even in Germany, I would say. Uh, it's a really amazing company. Um, so that's uh, Disruptive Berlin. Uh, so now we move to from conferences to a kind of meta conference. Uh, so TED is a really interesting brand and um, a kind of key format former for for this type of community. So speaking, uh, I think a lot of people here would have interacted with TED. So they have online videos of talks, which are all 18 minutes long, and they all are from kind of innovators in their fields, experts in their field, telling you kind of a kernel of one or two ideas that uh, they think will change the world. Um, so TED was a brand that started in the mid 80s, um, but, uh, and they were kind of, it was, it was a Silicon Valley thing, and um, the format developed, and then in the mid 90s they sort of opened it up and started putting them online. No, sorry, the mid 2000s, excuse me. And then they sort of started uh, uh, doing licensing other cities outside of Silicon Valley to uh, have these type of events. So you can apply to have a TED, and I'm sure there's a TEDx Montreal. There must be uh, an officially licensed TED. And I got together with a friend of mine, Daniel Keller, who's another artist based in Berlin from the States, uh, to do um, TEDx in Vaduz, which is the um, which is uh, the capital of Liechtenstein. So I don't know if anybody's uh, familiar with Liechtenstein, but it's a, it's a, a quadruple landlocked uh, country, principality in between Switzerland and Austria. Um, and it is primarily known for its financial services industry. Um, it's, uh, it's known, uh, it has been described as a tax haven every now and again, but um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of activity that goes through banks there. And so I wanted to do a, a, TED, a TED conference that directly addressed that through its location. So I applied uh, with the curator of the Museum uh, Liechtenstein, the Kunstmuseum Liechtenstein, to have TEDx for dudes uh, happen. And um, we got that, uh, we got that license, which is great. And uh, this, is, uh, this is an image from TEDx for dudes. This is uh, Femke Herregraven, one of the people that I had speaking there. I had uh, a, num a number of artists speaking. I wanted to be kind of artist heavy on this one. And Daniel and I um, collaborated to design the stage. So you can't really see it from this image, but um, uh, Femke is standing on a, a rendition of Liechtenstein as a tropical island. Um, so she's standing right on Vaduz there, and the backdrop is a backdrop with all of, uh, like a giant tag cloud of all of the possible words uh, that you may most likely come up with in a TED conference. So it's the most likely, most used words in TED ever. Um, so she, she talked about uh, one of the things which is symptomatic of the programming that we did, which was uh, a kind of game that she made called Taxidus, where you have like, where you can uh, plan where you want to do, where you want to put your tax around the world to create the least, uh, what the best situation for your company. So that was an interesting thing. Um, I then made that into, I kind of documented that into an exhibition about, about our TED conference. Uh, and this happened at uh, T293, uh, which is a gallery I work with in Rome. And this is again the stage. So here you get a little bit of a better sense, uh, this tropical island as Liechtenstein. So you really get this kind of onshore, offshore thing happening. Um, this is a work by Katja Novatskova on there, who was also speaking uh, at the event. And this is Dan um, on the, yeah, on the base there. You can't really see, but there's a little coconut lying on the island there. Um, and that coconut is an audio version of the backdrop. Um, so yeah. I made a number of um, uh, TEDx Vaduz atmospheres, is what I called them. They were little kind of plexiglass boxes where I iced my successful uh, application onto cakes. Um, so in here you have a sort of a cake, 
uh, a TEDx cake uh, with a successful application on it, and that sort of sits in between, again, this kind of offshore space and the backdrop. Um, yeah, there you get a little close-up of the icing job, local uh, Vaduz icing company. Yep, that's, uh, so it has a little sort of chamber up the middle that kind of goes, uh, plexiglass in a tube, which sort of goes from Vaduz Island up into the case of the, uh, of the icing. This is, uh, this is Femke's piece, so each, each talk, again, I kind of con uh, condensed into one of these atmospheres, uh, slides from them in little quotes. Uh, here you have uh, Peter Fend was another artist that we got involved uh, from a different generation. He's an artist who uh, made a, a, a corporation in the 80s, Ocean Earth, and has been doing a lifelong project of uh, kind of uh, proposing different land use. Uh, uh, and he proposed a, a tax system for, um, for Liechtenstein, which was based on uh, the right uses of the land. So if you moved out of the mudflats and onto the hills uh, and let the mudflats uh, for, um, for other types of energy production, you got tax cuts. It was quite a nice System. These are drawings of his. This is moving on to another project, uh, focusing on yet another tech entrepreneur, but um, one who's slightly more notorious. Um, so this is a scene from a raid which happened, a police raid, which happened in New Zealand, in Auckland, near Auckland, where I'm from, of a guy called Kim.com. Now, he's a, um, he founded a company called Mega Upload, and he uh, had platform Mega Video. And uh, he moved to New Zealand from Germany via Hong Kong um, a few years ago. And uh, he was running mega, mega, mega Upload and Mega Video and a bunch of other mega projects from there. Um, and the US government uh, are now, had, since that moment, which was also January 2012, uh, wanted to, to extradite him to be uh, put on some pretty serious charges of uh, yeah, racketeering and uh, facilitating the distribution of copyrighted material on a mass scale and profiting from it, these kinds of things. Um, and as a part of that process, they, uh, they raided his house in a really spectacular raid, which is very unusual for New Zealand. Um, and, uh, you know, armed people in a helicopter coming in. It was really kind of Bond-esque. Um, and this is the police uh, removers removing a list of things from his house that uh, had, had value, right? So this is his large TV. And in the background, you see his predator statue. Both of these things were seized by the police. Um, this is Kim on the cover of Wired magazine. Um, <clears throat> This is Kim's house uh, viewed from the helicopter as it's, uh, as it's approaching. Um, this is his mansion, uh, which is the most expensive house in the country. Um, this is the New Zealand police breaking down the doors. Uh, and this is the property subject for forfeiture from the, um, from the indictment of Kim. So the first thing on the list uh, is $175 million in US cash. Uh, and then the next 60 items on the list, there's 110 items, are bank accounts around the world. Um, there's also a number of other things in there, so there's a number of kind of hardware things, but there's also a small number of artworks. So um, it's, it's a pretty interesting list, and I was really taken by this list. I thought it was a very evocative thing to look at, um, mainly because it's kind of an interesting, if you imagine the, the, the list as a kind of, if you imagine it as a collection, right, if you manage it, if you imagine that, it's kind of, if you subset it, so it's, first of all, you have the sort of Venn diagram circle of Kim's collection, right, which exists of a number of things, but then you have another collection which is like named by the US government, and, and the kind of, the place where that interacts, I feel, is, is this list, and that's a very interesting list. Um, so I wanted to make a project where I kind of got to understand what this list of stuff meant. So a number of kind of uh, debates raged around Kim from then on, uh, and uh, about privacy, about access, about, about knowledge. This was all pre-Snowden as well. So uh, it, it also kind of compounded when the Snowden leaks came out because it, uh, Kim was then speculating, has he been spied on by this group of people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But so uh, when I started working with this project, and it's now had three different iterations over a period of about a year and a half, um, I wanted to visualize this material as a group of things, right? So first of all, I made a bunch of labels, and here you have the label for the first uh, for the first uh, group of thing, which is 175 million US dollars in cash. And so again, I wanted to use the language of user interface design, kind of ripping from Kim's design of his own website, um, kim.com. Um, and uh, here is a number of his other things. So I tried to stick to this list and sort of bring as many objects into the space as well uh, as I could. So here we bought a predator from, uh, from a sculptor in Kim's hometown in Kiel, um, Germany. And here we borrowed uh, 
you see a mask on a bed there. Um, this mask is, is, is a sculpture by an artist named Colin Christian, who's, uh, who works uh, in the US. Um, and Kim extensively collected his work. Uh, and a number of pieces were, um, were on that list. Uh, so uh, Colin generously lent that for the show as well. Um, you have uh, a number of other things, another, art, another artwork there, leaning against the server racks. Uh, so 60 servers was another thing on there. But this artwork was uh, by an artist named Olaf Muller, who's based in Hong Kong. Um, and then there's a number of wheels. So Kim had 25 luxury vehicles on that list too. In this particular iteration, we couldn't fit vehicles into the space. Uh, but we did get a number of number plates uh, uh, remade because uh, Kim had some flashy number plates as well. I think from memory, God, Stoned, Hacker, Police, Good, Evil, these kind of things. Um, and then there's a paper trail uh, in these vitrines in front. Um, because I, st I wanted to, how do you visualize bank accounts, right? How do you, how do you make a, a, a representation of a bank account? So I thought the best way to do that is to open bank accounts, right? That's, uh, that's the best way to do it. So I started a company, megavid.eu, and I registered that with a New Zealand uh, company's office, and I got a lawyer to start trying to open bank accounts all around the world in these different banks where Kim had, um, had accounts. Uh, not a very successful operation, that part of the show. Uh, here's another angle of that view at the Mumok in Vienna. Uh, here we have the second iteration of the same show in, uh, in Essex, uh, in First Sight in Colchester. Uh, here we have actual cars, so Mercedes were very generous for this one. They gave us uh, two of the, uh, the same models that Kim had uh, in the same color. And then we have another Predator, uh, so each time I try and bring different objects together to visualize the same list. Um, yeah, for me, as a sculptor, interesting questions are kind of scale. Uh, and this thing, you know, when you're kind of, when you're looking at stuff online, when you're reading and, and watching videos online, you know, you get these different resolutions, right? You kind of get like the crappy version where you wish that NYPD blue looked a little sharper, but then you get the real HD ones as well. I wanted to have that in the kind of sculptural qualities of the objects that I was showing. So some are very one-to-one, -one, like these cars. This is pretty much exactly what these things looked like. And uh, same with the Predator. But then uh, other things were not so one-to-one. Um, -one. So you have, oh, here's a Harley Davidson. Um, here's a, um, a watch. Uh, from Devon, he had this amazing timepiece. Um, and there's a, a Sidhu uh, uh, a jet ski. Okay, and then here's the third third iteration. So again, time's passed, and this is in, a, in an art gallery in New Zealand, which is um, close to. Uh, close to um, the parliament in New Zealand. Um, and uh, this, this is amazing because we were able to put my, uh, uh, my poster on, on the bank because there's a bank right next to the, uh, to the, to the art uh, gallery, amazingly. Um, so this is the poster for that. Um, here is the image from where we got the Predator from for the New Zealand edition. Uh, this, is a, this is a tattoo parlor in Rotorua. Uh, they generously lent the... Uh, um, now, it's, there's a few things that have changed over Kim's figure, and he's read really differently in different contexts. And up until this point, he'd been kind of, um, he'd been read as, as standing in for these privacy conversations internationally. And when I did these shows, there was always significant media interest, um, but they were, you know, they were focusing on privacy, on copyright, on these kinds of issues. But Kim uh, in New Zealand started to play this massive role. He became this huge, huge celebrity in New Zealand. And, the, the main media covered a lot of his, uh, of his activity. And at one point, he started a political party. So, um, so Kim started a party called the Internet Party. And they, um, they ran for election recently. Uh, New Zealand's just come out of an election period. And, um, and they also collaborated with the MANA Party, so the indigenous, one of the indigenous Maori parties in New Zealand. Um, so there was an Internet MANA Party for a moment there, which is a pretty interesting concept in itself. But uh, Kim's uh, reception in New Zealand changed a lot uh, when, when he entered politics. Um, people felt very strongly about it. New Zealand is, uh, felt is it appropriate for a foreign guy who's potentially a criminal to be getting involved in our, le in, our, in our political system. He's obviously very wealthy, so we can put a lot of resources into it. So showing this in New Zealand was very different than showing it in other parts of the world. And um, I wanted to kind of take that all into the kind of way that I worked with the material. So here's Kim um, in a video from Vice magazine uh, in front of uh, a, a mural in his gaming room. So this obviously is a, it's a, it's a piece that stays on the wall. Uh, it's not an artwork that was seized in the material, but it's it's, a, it's an artwork by a group of, um, of painters uh, called Cut Collective, um, and they do kind of street graffiti. I don't know how do you label it. They, they, you know, painting in a way, wall painting. 
And uh, yeah, this is in Kim's gaming room here. You have Kim in front of it. Here's a, obviously a portrait of Kim integrated into that and behind him Mona, his wife, whom he just separated from. And a number of kind of like dudes and cars and kind of reminiscent of this kind of group of stuff that he has anyway. But this was commissioned before the raid. And interestingly, uh, Kim was uh, the top, uh, top player on Call of Duty at the time when he was in the world, uh, on the time when he was, uh, was arrested. And um, yeah, so I wanted to bring this, the logic of this, uh, of this painting into the show as, to, as a kind of way to interface my creative system with, um, with a kind of creative system and an art logic that was, uh, was of something that he was closer to. So I got in touch with Cut Collective and I wanted them to come and hang the show with me uh, to remake the piece and also to kind of work the piece, work parts of the piece into the, into the ways that I was showing the material in, uh, in New Zealand. So here we have uh, the New Zealand iteration. I, I blew up uh, these, um, these, uh, these labels into giant canvases about the same scale as you saw at the Montreal Biennale. So they were, they were much larger uh, in New Zealand. There was much more massive and bigger impact. Uh, and, uh, and here you can kind of see that the re 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 reproduction of that, um, of, that, uh, of that spray mural on the, on the far wall there. So that's like a kind of a miniature version of it. Uh, here we have a number of other objects. Uh, I didn't put the whole uh, Predator statue together this time. I left them in pieces. Um, and this is another, one of the cool things about um, the way that I can interpret this list when I make these presentations is some of the, some of the uh, points on the list are very specific and they kind of say model number X acquired X, Y, Z, but others are very vague. And one of the things uh, that I was interpreting here was the change for every kind of show was a, a fiberglass sculpture. That was, all, that was all the information we had. So uh, that gives me a lot of kind of creativity in the way that I can interpret that. And here's a work of a uh, well-known New Zealand artist, Michael Patakofai, uh, who's, a, who's a Maori contemporary artist, and he makes these group kabahaka of, um, of figures that are kind of security guards. There's, yeah, there's a whole context in which he creates them. But I kind of kept him in, and it was interesting to kind of place that in relationship to the, the, the Predator statue and what that stood for, and, uh, and Colin Christian mask, uh, yeah. Here you have a bunch of bank logos and a mega upload, a bunch of TVs Kim, Kim had. Yeah, and there she is. Uh, here again, the, uh, the, the number plates, wow, mafia. Um, yeah, there's the base of the Predator statue. Uh, down the stairs, 175 million US dollars translated into New Zealand currency and then shredded and borrowed from the, um, borrowed from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. So they were a, they were a lender to the, to the exhibition as well. Um, this is again that same quote, and then uh, and then yeah, this, you can see how I kind of try to make a consistent system really hang on every kind of corner of this gallery. Um, here you get again excerpts from uh, from Kim's material, and um, and uh, here yeah, the kind of uh, my, my system starts directly interacting with the painting system of Cut Collective. Um, yeah, you get another uh, bunch of dudes, a uh, hooded sculpture again, something less specific. Um, Parts of Toyota. Toyota were much more interestingly, uh, you know, uh, nearer Germany. Uh, Mercedes were into doing it. They weren't so into doing it in New Zealand, and Toyota kind of stepped in, which is interestingly, um, yeah, how cars uh, play themselves out as, as dominant brands in those regions as well. Here you have Mona on the side here. And here's a, here's a kind of server room, again, with excerpts from, um, from, the, from the painting, uh, interacting with PayPal and other things. Um, yeah, there's Kim himself exploding from a couple of banks. Um, so the, the, final, the final project I want to talk through is uh, something I just finished at Porticus um, in Frankfurt. Uh, New Management was the name of the exhibition. And this was an exhibition about, um, about Samsung and about, uh, about a moment in their managerial history, a, a pivot point in their managerial history. Um, so this is a Bloomberg Business Week uh, cover, uh, which features Lee Kun Hee, who's the chair, chairman of Samsung. Uh, Samsung is one of the most uh, powerful uh, companies in South Korea, and um, uh, they're also one of the most recognizable and impacting brands uh, in the economics, in the sorry, electronics field. But it wasn't always that way. So Samsung very quickly rose to prominence in the electronics context, and in the in the early 90s, um, they were kind of they were semiconductor producers and they produced RAM, but uh, uh, they had not gone into any other kind of, seriously into any other type of um, reach in terms of their electronics production. And this was something Lee Kun-hee wanted to change. Um, 
So in 1993, um, Lee Kun-hee had a meeting in Frankfurt um, at, the, at the, so he flew a number of his top executives from South Korea over to, over to a hotel, a Kempinski hotel near the airport in Frankfurt, and had a, a meeting where he laid down what was then referred to as the Frankfurt Declaration, uh, where he declared uh, a new management strategy for, ex uh, for expanding, basically, it was a sort of, uh, radical expansion of the business. Um, and here you have him in the talks over these few days where he laid down this material in 93. And as you can see in the background, you have uh, a canaletto or, or a sort of um, a copy of a canaletto painting of the Rialto Bridge. Um, this, uh, this painting was then after the event, which is a very important uh, event in Samsung's own history. They tell, they tell this often, the Frankfurt Declaration is this kind of pivot point for them. They, they created a, a memorial room, which I read about in the Bloomberg article, uh, and to, to the focal point of this memorial room supposedly is uh, this exact painting, this, uh, this, this, uh, this painting of Venice. And uh, so they bought a bunch of things up off the, the Frankfurt Hotel and, uh, and made this kind of room. And this room to me, the existence of this room was really compelling to me. I saw it as a sort of monument to a really important moment in the expansion of one of the most important hardware makers and therefore one of the most important cultural producers on the planet. And so I wanted to kind of reimagine this and reinscribe it um, in a different language in, uh, in, in Frankfurt again. So bring, bring the Frankfurt Declaration back to Frankfurt, basically. Um, so I, I started looking into this. It's quite, you know, it's easy and hard to get information about this. Um, and this is the hotel where it took place, uh, the, the, the Gravenbrook Hotel, Kempinski. Um, these are two books that I found which dealt uh, with, uh, with, this, with the philosophies, the new management philosophy. So you get a textbook and you had a, um, a comic book explaining the philosophy as well. Uh, so here's an excerpt from, uh, from that philosophy. Um, so uh, you have, uh, in the past, due to borders or customs, strong and weak countries could be separated from each other like animals in the zoo, uh, and you have that there. And then you have, but because of the development of uh, transports and communication, already since a long time, the global and uh, world became like a jungle again. So you, know, you get this idea, there's a lot of imagery about competition, intense competition, national competition, and um, uh, yeah, a lot of kind of conflict. Um, conflict representation in these, uh, in these uh, comics. So here again, you get uh, an intensely kind of, yeah, militaristic uh, representation of NAFTA, the EU, ASEAN, you know, economic groups that were really relevant at the time. Um, and this was my initial imagining of what that room might look like. Um, here you have a, a monument that I found uh, at the headquarters of um, Samsung in Europe. So a kind of a close thing to the Frankfurt Declaration. Um, here's some images from the Bloomberg article. So this is the headquarters in, in this is this, uh, it's like an executive training center in South Korea uh, where the Frankfurt uh, room supposedly exists. Um, this is another kind of uh, situation, another piece that kind of came out of that context. So change begins with me is one of the most, um, yeah, known uh, phrases that came out of that exchange. And uh, here you have it kind of cascading across Europe. Um, the Frankfurt Declaration sort of going across of Russia. This was like a brass plate that was in the, in the, in the memorial room. Um, and so I, I reimagined this in the portico space, which is kind of like a little church anyhow. It's like a, um, it's a, it's a gallery on an island, so it's in the middle of the Main River. And um, it has a very high ceiling, like an eight, eight and a half meter ceiling, and a kind of a viewing area from above. And I sort of made this into a, an, yeah, an imagining of this memorial space. So I had, uh, had the Rialto Bridge painting repainted. Uh, I, I stenciled uh, new management on, on the end of it, and I kind of imagined the, the, uh, the, 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 the presentation table from the uh, hotel again in this zone. So here we have a kind of a, uh, a presentation zone and memorial, and uh, also a, a kind of two-way mirror structure, which mirrors the uh, the painting. Because I don't know how much you guys look at Canaletto, but that's actually it's actually backwards. The the uh, the Canaletto picture was a kind of mirror image picture in itself. So I wanted to sort of reflect on that, correct that uh, in this two-way mirror. You enter the space, and you're immediately in this kind of uh, situation where there's uh, a kind of humming air conditioning units uh, that have excerpts from the philosophy uh, branded onto them. So here you can see change begins with me goes along there. You can't maybe read these, but you have again excerpts. When a group has changed, a society can be changed. And they're sort of humming away, uh, blowing this uh, yeah, Samsung philosophy air around the room. 
Uh, here you have a timeline uh, by Samsung themselves. Uh, uh, reproduced on the wall. Um, here are a bunch of objects. So I went to South Korea I, uh, in the research for this. I, I contacted Samsung. Um, they're, they're very involved in uh, the contemporary art world. Um, they're collectors. They have a museum. There's a museum called the Leum Museum, which is named after Lee Kun Hee. Uh, and uh, we got in touch with them, uh, tried to do a conversation. Um, but unfortunately, they weren't able to work with me on this particular project. But um, I, I stayed at the, the Schiller Hotel, which is another hotel which uh, Samsung Owns is one of the most grand hotels in Seoul, and uh, I collected a bunch of material from there to kind of bring together as my own monument to my research and uh, and that trip. Um, here's the Burj Khalifa, uh, uh, like uh, on a, on a, on an air conditioning box. Uh, one of Samsung's uh, achie high achievements is that they built uh, built the Burj Khalifa. Their their construction arm built them. Uh, here's, a, here's a timeline in phones, a timeline in hardware, and the Gla Galaxy S4 and is the kind of high point of their, uh, of their out output into the, they're now, or well, at least they were when I did this exhibition, which was a couple of months ago, uh, the, the biggest electronics company by, uh, by revenue on the planet. Um, so a very important cultural force. Uh, here's, a, here's a TV, uh, again, an, uh, behind an excerpt from the Frankfurt Declaration. And here from above, you get this whole kind of system uh, where you can see the air conditioners and the, and the presentation table really working together. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a few projects. Um, maybe we can go into questions. I know I've run through a lot of material. I can go back and talk in more detail over other things, or we can just finish also, uh, depending. Okay, questions maybe, yeah. So apparently there's microphones uh, in the hallways there, very daunting. One has to kind of enter these spaces. Uh, it's absolutely fine if there's no questions as well. Um, we can. So. Hey, thanks so much. Pleasure. Um, so the question I wanted to ask you that's really been at the back of my mind this whole time is sort of, uh, I mean, the, the work that you're showing is, I mean, in a sense, it's kind of like anthropological, it's sort of didactic. You're, you're really, in, in, in every case, I mean, except for maybe the case modding a little bit less, but you're presenting information about corporations and their practices, or you're like replicating a conference in much the same fashion it's originally conducted. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there's not a lot of, uh, expression or commentary on your part. Um, it's okay. sort of, it, it's, it's a real presentation of facts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a bit more about your, your sort of motivation for what you want to bring across. Well, my motivation is I think that these are, um, these are very important cultural forces in our world, right? Certainly the people that kind of create the infrastructure for communication, the, the systems by which we are able to communicate and receive information. I think these group of people are very, I mean, if you can call them a group of people, are very powerful in our world, right? And so I wanted to kind of highlight their importance and uh, look a little, little more closely at their practices because I think their cultural practices have, um, have uh, a huge importance in the way that uh, my life is and, and the life of the world. And I think, uh, I think uh, giving, giving them a kind of uh, a proper cultural reading and, and a space in the arts is, um, is something that's very worthwhile. That's, that's basically my, my understanding of it. Yeah. So I think, you know, to look very closely at who these people are, at, uh, at what they're saying, I mean, to, particularly with the DLD presentation, I was able to do that, to kind of get a kind of look at the community and, and what its values are and, and what its images are and what type of culture it is uh, it's representing in the world, you know? And I think that's very important material for us to, um, to for anybody to, uh, to consider, right? I think it's like uh, some of the most important, yeah, as I say, some of the most important cultural material on the planet. Uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was kind of waiting the whole presentation to hear if you got any feedback from Kim.com or the DLD folks or anything like that. Yeah, okay, so I can talk about that a bit. So DLD, obviously, this is a, yeah, maybe a good thing to mention. So some projects I'm very close to the subject with and other projects I'm, I take a distance from, right? This is a, something that's sometimes practical and sometimes something I inscribe myself. So with the DLD project, I was very close to them. So uh, they, they gave me permission to use the material. They you know, tried to enable my production as much as I could. They, as I said, included my as a kind of collateral event in the next object and they've invited me back to other DLD conferences to be a spectator. And uh, and so um, with that, uh, you know, they were they gave me a lot of space to to work with them because they're very interested in artists. Obrist, uh, Hans Ulrich Obrist is is programming their their 
their, um, their arts con context uh, and the content in that. Uh, and he's an open guy who is amazing at bringing people together from different contexts. And, uh, and he's somebody I have had a conversation with ever since I did that uh, conversation. So I, I felt very close to, to that group in that situation. And when they came, you know, they kind of, they weren't that involved in my preparation. As I said, they didn't put any restrictions on what I was going to do with the material, which is an amazing amount of trust to give an artist. Uh, and when they came to see the final unveiling of it, just the day before their conference opened, they were blown away. You know, they, they just loved it. They were like, oh, you know, this is something where we, I forgot that guy was talking. Oh, I remember that guy was a nice guy. Maybe not that guy. And, you know, it was like a really great interaction because in these events, you actually don't have a proper sense of what's going on. There's so much happening at once, like a little bit like this week, you know. You don't really have an overview of what's going on. So they really, I think, have really appreciated that. Um, but with, uh, with Kim, it was, I wanted to have a slightly different thing. So uh, Kim, I, I wanted to keep my distance from. So what we did is we let his lawyers know that I was doing it. So Kim works with a number of lawyers. And you know, kind of give him the opportunity to object if that was something he wanted to do. But we got, I got back, you know, word of mouth uh, was what, what he said was cool shit. Uh, so that's, um, yeah. That's I was cool. actually just kind of asking if any, any of them sense critique. So maybe that's, maybe that's his reaction. Well, I think like, yeah, so the, the DLD thing, I did this kind of full walkthrough with them and uh, the founders and, uh, and yeah, a couple of the people working there. And they, 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 I think they expected critique, but um, they didn't find it. So, um, yeah, I think that's interesting because some people have interpreted that piece as critical. And um, this is often a question I get about my position in general, and maybe this is also where you're coming from, is, uh, uh, you know, some people walk through that installation that you've seen at the Montreal Biennale and say, oh, uh, you know, well done for um, unpacking the, the, the rhetoric of the neoliberal world, you know, like, that's a, gr you know, it's a great critical piece. And, and other people kind of walk through and say, how could you provide an advertisement for a media company like that, you know? So I think, I think that line is, some, is something that people find their own way through. Uh, and that's something I'm very happy with, you know? Sandra? I, thought, I just thought that was an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. No, I, I guess it's hard not to see the it's hard not to see the critical component, I guess, for the Kim one, especially when you have an air condition. I mean, I guess the only sentence mm. where I sort of the deadpan or sardonic, let's say, look was at the end when the air conditioners blow the air around. Right. And I mean, it's because these are huge influences on our Right. Absolutely. It's actually terrifying to watch what you show because <laughs> no, because they are such incredible influences on yeah. us. And there you go up to them. I mean, you put the money back into the bank, but shredding it, and they're funding right. you. So right. I just yeah. thought that to have the guts to blow the air around like that <laughs> is no. I mean, it gives a little, it does give power back. I mean, it, it to me it was an example of how art can give power back to people in right. the face of incredible, uh, anyway, that's all. Well, that's I really that. appreciate that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, oh, Greg. Yeah. I probably should uh, introduce myself as uh, Gregory Burke, the one of the curators of the Biennale. I'm also a fellow New Zealander. And um, just picking up on what some of the uh, last couple of questions. Uh, we had a chat when, when you first arrived here about how you've just been in New Zealand. Yeah. And that uh, Charles Escher had, effect, had in fact critiqued your work as a sort of valorization of the neoliberal systems. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, how um, this, uh, this book came out during the election called Dirty Politics, written by this guy, Nicky Hager, who had exposed a lot of this, uh, the kind of the manipulation that goes on in the and the kind of hacking into uh, people's political parties' computer systems and 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 so on. And uh, this had come out during the election campaign, and that you were actually working with Nikki Hager for the for the New Zealand Pavilion in Venice, and how even some of our major donors to the Venice uh, Pavilion have now pulled out because you think you're associated with this guy. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I can speak to that if that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, pre I'm, preparing, a, um, I'm preparing a presentation for Venice next year. So uh, New Zealand has chosen me as their, as their artist to represent them at Venice. And um, 
Yeah, it's a complex thing. It's a it's a it's a it's a complex commission, right? It's something I really wanted to do. It's like a, um, it's a, it's a real honor to be working with an official commission like that, and to be. But of course, it brings a lot of content, right? And this is content I'm really interested in. So it's like an official, you know, on some level, it's a diplomatic thing, right? It's a government to government inv in invitation, and. Um, I thought it was the right moment to start dealing with things which are affecting sovereignty at the moment, and uh, and so I, you know, when I pitched my pitch to get this uh, commission, um, I pitched that I would like to kind of unpack some of the material that's been coming about out about uh, New Zealand's involvement in uh, in the uh, context of uh, yeah of international. Um, uh, surveillance and uh, these types of things. And um, I, I was really attracted, like a lot of artists, to these slides uh, which came out, like visually, and I think there's like a lot of information in those slides um, to uh, unpack, to unpack culturally, to unpack in a kind of longer context. And, uh, and I, you know, like in many of these situations, uh, when I'm uh, approaching an area of knowledge which I don't have a long history in, I try to consult with um, with experts in the field, right? And uh, and created New Zealand, the, the Arts Council in New Zealand. Uh, you know, we, we looked together to find the right person. And uh, Nikki uh, Hager put out this book in the mid 1990s called Secret Power. And uh, and it's it was one of the first times New Zealanders had an idea of what our arm of these intelligence agencies is doing. And uh, it was an amazing book at the time. And I also know since later, like people even within the in the defense world um, look to that as, as information, uh, as a kind of textbook in a way. So it's, it was amazing, an amazing contribution and controversial at the time, but historical, right? It's kind of 20 years ago-ish. And, um, and so we signed him up because I thought he's the guy who knows. If I have to fact check, if I have to understand how these systems work, this is the guy. And then it came out, yeah, then he dropped a, this book a week later. And, <laughs> and so uh, the reception of that in New Zealand uh, and, and of my position in New Zealand was um, much more extreme than it had been in the past. And also Kim. Uh, so I'd been fo focusing on Kim.com and the way that his work was, uh, his, you know, the way these group of objects could stand in for these important conversations. But then as, as Kim entered politics and became a more politic polemic figure in himself, and it was seen that I was also working with that narrative, uh, you can see how people considered my position to be a little more politicized than I might have at first imagined. So uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting space to get into, um, and it's a space which I'm enjoying working through, because uh, this is, of course, these are the places where you really get to unpack what cultural impact um, things have, you know? And uh, I don't want to say too much about what I'm doing with the Venice Project, but I'm trying, to put, uh, I'm trying to put that material in a longer context. So one of the great things about the New Zealand pavilion is that we don't actually have a building, we don't actually have a pavilion. So you can choose a pavilion which is uh, content relevant, right? And, um, and so I have chosen to work primarily in this space, uh, the Marciana Library, um, in, right in San Marco. That will be our pavilion, or at least yeah, that'll be our pavilion, um, and uh, it's designed as a kind of giant allegory for uh, by jo Jacopo Sansovino, like one of the most important architects of the Venetian Renaissance period, uh, as a kind of as an allegory for um, for knowledge, the, the benefits of acquiring and keeping knowledge. Right, like that's that's what the space is, and it also houses this amazing collection of con of, uh, of maps from that period, including a very famous map called Fra Mauro's World Map, uh, which is an imagining of. Uh, the kind of uh, of the world from, from Venice at that time, right? And so it's a, one of the first maps to ever um, represent Japan, for example, uh, from from Europe. And uh, and this this map and those and they had some historical globes from that period as well. These these kind of visualizations of basically kind of geopolitical space, I thought was a really interesting thing to kind of put in dialogue with these systems, uh, with these intelligence systems. Because again, it's like about how you reimagine the world, right? It's about how you kind of, uh, how, how geopolitical space is imagined uh, is now through these kind of different networks and these different systems of information. And, and that, that, that affects geography, right? And that affects our understanding of what geography is. So yeah, that's where I'm going with it. Nikki is an advisor. Um, some people, uh, I think, are potentially misunderstanding my uh, in interest in these things because uh, I don't see my work as activist or um, partisan. I see it as cultural. And I think regardless of, uh, regardless of uh, what you think about whether the Snowden releases should have happened, they are in public space. These documents do exist, and they're very powerful 
cultural objects, right? So uh, I think contextualizing them is work that an artist can do, and, um, and an artist in a kind of national uh, commission like this is a very unique place to activate that, right? Yeah, that's that context. Hey. Hello. Um, so we, we talked about this before, but like that picture that you have right there, it's kind of like you've designed the space, like it's the space of power or like it's a, like a moment in time. Mm -hmm. So like I was asking you before, um, what's interesting, like even with Kim, there's this like shows, showbiz aspect right. to it. And uh, so I want you, to, because it's a, um, like a bunch of information that you're putting together, but visually like you do sense that moment in time. So I just want you to talk about that aspect, that entertainment aspect. Yeah, I mean, I think I view, uh, maybe this is a question about how I view my role as an exhibition maker a little bit. And um, I try to make, I try to give viewers a, a lot to work with. You know, I try to, um, I try to have like lots of visual things you can work with, uh, lots of textual informational things you can work with. And I try to also take from the language of these uh, contexts which I cover, right? So uh, I find marketing a really interesting context. I find um, design obviously a really interesting context. And uh, I find, um, uh, yeah, I mean the showbiz aspect of like being like putting on exhibitions a very interesting thing to kind of build into the fabric of what the presentation is like, right? So like, for example, in this presentation, the kind of the, the very physical way that you enter the space, all of these things are part of the exhibition making craft, which I kind of kind of take from different contexts. I don't know if that answers your question, but how do you choose? Like, how do you choose what you what what pulls your interest? Like, how did you? Well, I try to... Um, like, how did you pick this? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to uh, make the best presentation of the material which I work with that I can, and I try to work with uh, the most urgent information to me that I find, the most culturally urgent information that I find in the world at, at a certain time. Obviously, there's like a, there's a durational aspect with my practice, both in design and in, you know, because obviously what's interesting, again, well, one of the interesting things about the DLD presentation is, you know, a lot of people come and they say, "Oh, that looks really out of date, right?" But it looks kind of it like looks kind of old school design. But it's in in essence, it's kind of extreme moments from only a couple of years ago. And I think the durational aspect of presentations and the durational aspect of design and how that influences how we receive information, that's one of the tools that I like to kind of play up in in the presentations I make as well. Yeah. Cool. Oh, got one more. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been listening to a, a podcast over the last few weeks. It's, uh, it's called The Tim Ferriss Show. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Tim Ferriss. He's nope. like a, a guy, the, the guy who wrote uh, The Four Hour Work Week. And oh, yeah. He's, he's a guy that's very much involved in the yep. startup. I know what. Yep. Uh, startup thing. And he interviews a lot of people that I saw at your, uh, your exposition yesterday. Yeah, it's a cohesive and group. Yeah. What I find very like, uh, recurring and interesting about his, his podcast is the fact that he. They, um, there's this uh, interest for stoicism, mm -hmm. you know, stoicism philosophy. So mm -hmm. I found that, like, in some part, I, I see what you're doing, and I think many people see it as something that is very modern. But at the same time, when I listen to to these people, I find that maybe there's a there's like a, a gene genealogy. Okay. You know what I mean, like yeah, a, genealogy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to know if you've like kind of thought about that. I'm, mm, have I, I thought about whether it's like a genealogy? A, I'm, I'm not expressing myself very clearly, <laughs> no, sorry, but uh, it's like uh, very rich people mm -hmm. who like have no uh, guilt about their wealth, but at the same time they want to share back. Yeah. Like there, there's this thing when you hear these people that uh, the giving back that is very kind of confusing because it's very rich people yeah. talk, talking about how people should live their life. So. Yeah, I think the value system of Silicon Valley is kind of complex, and this is like maybe what you're getting at is like, or how I, what I'm going to talk to anyway. It's uh, I think uh, I think that uh, uh, you know it's obviously liberal, right? It's like a liberal thing, and that's really strong. And uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do also the TEDx thing uh, is also because they look for ex exits a lot. This is a, this is an interesting concept that like Larry Page talks about, and Peter Thiel talks about. Uh, a, a kind of ideas of ideal and separate societies. That's a really interesting thing. That's a very strong interest in Silicon Valley. And um, 
you know, Peter Thiel talks about seasteading, this idea of kind of going out into uh, into the ocean, into international waters, and creating a country that has its own system in there. You know, and that's often that they they explain that because uh, I think you know people like Larry Page find uh, find regulation really annoying, right? It's for them it gets in the way of innovation, right? This is the thing which uh, this thing which it stops, and uh, so exiting that system, uh, you know, there's there are these different, as I can read it, kind of um, pulls towards these different things, right? And and on the one hand, they want to kind of do the most amazing stuff they can, and they just don't want to bother with all this kind of hassle, you know, in, in the path to creating the driverless car, you know. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, yeah, there's a societal interest as well. And I think that's kind of muddy. I think that my read of it is like, is their value systems are sort of defined in certain areas and sort of very indefined in other areas. And I think that's true with all value systems, actually. But um, but yeah, strong liberal, uh, definitely. You know, money is a thing that, that enables that that group of people. I think Jack Dorsey. One of the Jack Dorsey quotes uh, that's in the presentation is, uh, "Revenue is like oxygen, right? That's like that's one of the things that that is really important to them that they can do anything." Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very, very interesting group of, um, of, of values that come together because it's also like you can trace it back to like Stuart Brand and whole earth kind of thinking, like hippie thinking. I mean, the whole history of Silicon Valley is a really interesting one politically, right? Because it sort of comes from both the left and the right. And that's kind of a really interesting space to be in, you know, so. And this is actually reflected in the way that they, they you know, they fund as well. They fund, you know, of course, Silicon Valley, like any big, big companies in that kind of context, you know, give money to politics. And they generally fund both Republicans and, and, and Democrats uh, in, in the equal measure, right? That's kind of an interesting thing too. Yeah, it's a great space to look into. Like you can just spend hours unpacking that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and also like aesthetically, just to add like one final thing maybe before we end. Uh, you know that uh, they interact with culture and they interact with science, um, but like. Uh, uh, you know, street art culture is really strong there. So, like uh, these kind of disruptive values uh, are very kind of close to, um, yeah, close to kind of uh, how how they view kind of people uh, who are working in that type of art field, which I find really interesting. So, like I just read a Ben Horowitz book, for example, and he's photographed in front of a, a graffiti mural, right? And and you know, Facebook has artists and residents come in, and they're often from a street art context that do murals on walls. So the way that they interact with the kind of cultural sphere is often through this area, which I think is also are really interesting, and one of the reasons why it's interesting you can lo locate that in Kim's uh, history as well, right? It's not only gaming that's influencing his uh, his um, whatever imagery, but it's also uh, entrepreneurial culture, which has this kind of uh, punky thing too. Uh, TechCrunch disrupt the um, the the theme music is is uh, is dubstep, right? Like that's the that's the soundtrack of Silicon Valley right now. So that's interesting. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of all of us to thank Simon Denny for a really thought-provoking and interesting talk. Thank you so much.